I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a project that I was actually asked to handle on behalf of uh, PRI Australia. Uh, and it, it's, it's a call that came in from a group of Somali expatriates uh, that are located in a variety of places around the world, but um, they seem to be headquartered in the UK. And the name of the group is the World G18 Somalia. <clears throat> and it's made up of um, it's made up of Somalis from all 18 regions within Somalia, representing all of the major clans, um, which are basically break down to four major groups with a number of subclans. Uh, so, for one, the fact that this group was was formed uh, to begin with is something of a major accomplishment. Um, and what they've what they're trying to do is uh, basically piece the country back together after uh, 20 uh, troublesome years, um, which some of you are probably familiar with. And I'll, I'll, I'll go over some of the, the history of uh, Somalia um, and how the country has come to be uh, in the state that it's in. And uh, with that, I, I wanted to start um, in, in talking about permaculture and permaculture within the context of, of its application in Somalia. Uh, the, the only thing that makes sense is uh, really trying to recount or, or um, revisit some of the history and understand exactly what, what, what Somalia is about within what context we're trying to apply uh, permaculture. So I'm going I'm to go ahead and read through the intro. So any sensible discussion of, uh, related to the application of permaculture design in Somalia must begin with an examination of the context intended for use. For 20 years, Somalia has been a country plagued by civil war, drought, and famine. Most recently, the United Nations declared Somalia to be home to the worst humanitarian crisis on Earth, with the latest drought being the most severe seen within the region in approximately 50 years. It begs the question, uh, given all that we've seen from that country uh, pretty much since 1991, was there ever a time where Somalia wasn't in crisis? If so, how is it transformed into what we've come to know of the country and the region? How might we start to effectively help address the long-standing, persistent problems of Somalia, enabling it to find peace and security? Given that the creation of, of permaculture was prompted by a desire to address, quote, perceived social problems, how might it be utilized to address those found within Somalia? What should it look like? What should the solutions look like? What do they need to look like? And so the, the, the first portion of, of, the, of the presentations are uh, actually going to be uh, me taking some uh, excerpts from a, from a recently published article uh, called Somalia, the Real Causes of Famine, because I think there's a narrative about why there, there is a consistent problem with famine in the region. Uh, and, I, and according to people that are very familiar with the country, with the history of the country, um, the, the actual reasons for why this is a consistent problem are, are very different than most people um, understand. And I think it'll be very surprising uh, to some, if not most, as to why this country is consistently um, against the wall. So this is a, this is a piece written by a, 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 a professor of economics at the University of Ottawa named uh, Michael uh, Chisadovsky, and he begins the piece by, by asking uh, what outside forces triggered the destruction of the Somali state in the early 1990s. He says, uh, Somalia remained self-sufficient in food until the late 1970s, despite recurrent droughts. As of the early 1980s, its national economy was destabilized and food agriculture was destroyed. An entire country with a rich history of commerce and economic development was transformed into a territory. Somalia had been a colony of uh, Italy and Britain. In 1969, a post-colonial government was formed under President Mohamed Siad Barre. Major social programs in health and education were implemented. 
role in urban infrastructure was developed in the course of the 1970s, significant social prog uh, progress, including a mass literacy program, was achieved. In the early 1980s marks a major turning point. The IMF, World Bank Structural Adjustment Program, or SAP, SAP, was imposed on Sub-Saharan Africa. The recurrent famines of the 1980s and 1990s are in large part the consequence of IMF World Bank quote unquote economic medicine. In Somalia, 10 years of IMF economic medicine laid the foundations for the country's transition towards economic dislocation and social chaos. By the late 1980s, following recurrent quote unquote austerity measures imposed by what he calls the Washington Consensus, wages in the public sector had collapsed to $3 a month. The economic reforms, which included austerity measures and privatization of the central services, destabilized the economy and destroyed agriculture. Wages in the public sector were, were drastically reduced. Urban purchasing power declined dramatically, and the cost of fuel, fertilizer, and farm inputs shot up. This set the stage for the Civil War in 1991, from which Somalia has yet to recover. Famine and food aid became the norm, as hundreds of aid agencies set up shop to handle a crisis that was of their own making. In short, Somalia became a quote-unquote business opportunity that provided jobs to hundreds, if not thousands, of mostly Western aid agency employees. Nicholas Stockton, a former Oxfam executive director, once called this phenomenon the quote, moral economy, unquote. Michael Marin, whose book, The Road to Hell, should be required reading for those who want to understand the politics and economy of food aid, shows how this aid suppressed local food production in Somalia, fueled civil war, and created a permanent food crisis. This crisis and the lack of a strong, well-functioning central government have also result, resulted in a situation where aid agencies are zipping in and out of Somalia without any vetting by the government. In effect, Somalia is being managed and controlled by aid agencies. The government is there in name only. He goes on, aid agencies rarely report the root causes of famine, though in the case of Somalia, there is a tendency to blame the civil war and militia, such as al-Shabaab, which until recently had banned aid agencies from entering areas under its control. For more than two decades, civil war and famine have dominated the narrative about Somalia, but the Cape Town-based Somali novelist Nuruddin Farah believes that much of the commentary on the Somali Civil War is based on, quote, a false premise, that the Somali Civil War is the consequence of an age-old clan conflict. This view, he says, is unfortunately also held by a number of Somalis, which have no memory of the Somalia of his childhood, where the cosmopolitan capital Mogadishu, quote, was not only one of the prettiest and most colorful cities in the world, but also decidedly the oldest in sub-Saharan Africa and older than many of Europe's most treasured medieval cities. The real conflict in Somalia, he says, is not so much between clans, but between urban and pastoralist communities, especially those which migrated to Mogadishu, who visited havoc on, this, on the capital city in 1991 by forming contingents led by city-based men and, quote, armed with ancient injustices newly recast as valid grievances, unquote. The pastoralist Somalis, who are by nature urban phobics, he writes, saw the city as alien and parasitic. And because it occupied an ambiguous space in their hearts and minds, they gradually accumulated hostility towards the city until they became intent on destroying it. And again, uh, Chosadovsky explains uh, the, the influence that the policies that have been set forth by the uh, IMF and World Bank had destabilized the country but then also talks about how the food aid had made Somalia dependent on imported grain. Along with the periodic devaluations of the currency, this led to a hike in prices again of fuel, fertilizer, and farm inputs and the privatization of veterinary services. This is a significant point because there actually used to be quite a lot of trade of livestock between Somalia and much of the Arabian Peninsula. And in the early 80s, there was actually uh, a quarantine placed on much of the livestock coming out of Somalia because of uh, worries about disease. And, and actually, there are quite a few Somalis that, have, that, have, that are convinced that, that uh, many of the Arabs are trying to basically uh, choke them out, uh, basically trying to kill the country. 
U.S. grain supplies that entered the country in the form of food aid also destroyed local agriculture, he said. Food aid, in turn, was so often sold by the government on the, on the local market to cover domestic costs. The, the, again, the diversion of, of food aid is nothing new. Linda Pullman, who's a freelance writer from, uh, from Holland, uh, has written a book uh, that came out last year called The Crisis Caravan, What's Wrong with Humanitarian Aid? And she goes on to explain how uh, much of what passes for humanitarian aid is essentially, uh, it's, it's, it's just money that comes in to maintain uh, the operations of the organizations that go into the countries uh, to, to uh, address uh, many of these crises. Uh, she mentions that um, actually uh, global aid is a $120 billion business. So um, there's a lot of money uh, passing through these organizations and what's, what's interesting, what actually comes to mind now is um, I've been working with Steve Hart, who's in the audience, uh, on a project in Pakistan uh, to try to uh, deal with the situation in the, in the flood zones in Sindh. And uh, he's dealing with the nonprofit that I will not name. Uh, but much of what he has been telling me about his experience in trying to get what actually is in name a, a permaculture project that is being funded by uh, UK DFID, uh, the Department for International Development. Um, he's running into a lot of problems in dealing with the NGO, where they're routing money not to the places where it's supposed to go, but um, they're finding excuses as to why the money should be rerouted into uh, the operations of, of the organization itself. So um, much of what he's been telling me is, um, is, is reflected here in this, in this uh, paper. Uh, and then there's also, he goes on to mention uh, as well, uh, uh, Linda Pullman talks about how much of the food aid is actually used as a weapon. Um, to where uh, he goes on here, he says that, that uh, how Linda Pullman shows that in almost every crisis area around the world, warlords, militia, and soldiers have benefited by imposing taxes on humanitarian agencies or stealing and selling food aid to buy arms. Quite often, refugee camps become safe havens for militia who use the safety of the camps to regroup and recuperate. Refugee camps thus uh, indirectly prolong the civil wars. Now, what's interesting is, um, if any of you are familiar with the writer uh, Jared Diamond, he wrote an article in the late 80s, in 1987, uh, entitled, um, uh, The Worst Mistake uh, in the History of the Human Race. And, and he calls agriculture the worst mistake in the history of the human race. Because basically, because you're able to, to, to store surpluses in food, um, you can leverage the food as a weapon. So he, he goes on to talk about, you don't really see these, um, these chronic incidences of starvation and tyranny and warfare until the advent of, of agriculture. So we, we see how this theme is carried over into uh, aid situations. And in particular, I think this goes, to, goes on to explain quite, quite a lot about um, the situation we see in, in Somalia. So, uh, you know, one of the things that really bothered me about a lot of the conversation um, about Somalia, and I would, I would often go to London to sit in on meetings in, at, at Whitehall, was um, th there seemed to be almost a tendency to cast the Somalis like they were, like, like talk about them like they're Klingons. Like, they're like this warlike people that, that don't know how to, you know, to live in, in peace as if their, their situation was entirely of their making, as if the things that I just mentioned in the, in the piece um, weren't actually happening. And, and this, is, this is somewhat problematic because we can go in and talk about you know, uh, stereotypes about Africans and, and all the rest of it. Um, and and, and the, you know, when you talk about issues like piracy, for instance, and this is what's interesting to me um, when, when people like to, to mention the, the, the piracy um, issue. Um, I don't know how many people are, are aware of this, but uh, there is a really serious problem with the poaching of fish in Somalia. And it's a, it's a, major, it's a major industry uh, in, a, in, a, in a very poor country with a, with a small population. And I'll see if I can get rid of this. Thank you. Um, to the degree that there was an estimate made by a professor at the University of Minnesota who said that, I'm 
sorry. He said that they're pulling as much as $250 million of fish out of Somali waters annually. These are international fishing companies. 250, actually he said 250 to 350 million dollars. The, the estimates I've seen, the low end has been 90. But that's a lot of money when you're talking about a poor country uh, with a population of roughly 9 to 10 million people. That is consistently malnourished. And, and speaking to some of those uh, statistics, and if I can find this, uh, this paper, uh, some, of the, some of the st statistics that are quoted about that particular situation are quite startling. Uh, this is a paper that was actually prepared um, at, a, at a high level meeting uh, on agriculture and energy in, uh, in, in Libya uh, about three years ago. And he says here that with a population of 8.7 million in 2007, uh, this is a statistic from the World Bank, and an income per capita estimated in 2002 to be $226 compared to $515 in Sub-Saharan Africa. Somalia is one of the poorest countries in the world, having high undernourishment uh, levels with 36% underweight and human development index ranked uh, at, uh, at 161 out of 163 countries in 2001. The civil conflict since 1991, continuing, continuing insecurity in many parts of the country and poor access to services and infrastructure have made conditions worse than they have been before the Civil War. Uh, so you, you consistently see, again, these problems um, that are impacting the Somalis' ability to just get the most basic of needs. Um, I wanted to see if I can pull up this, uh, this paper, if I can. And this goes on to explain at least some of the things that we're proposing for the country to help address some of the problems that we're seeing there. Um, as you can probably um, tell, it's a, it's a, it's a country that's uh, arid, uh, arid to semi-arid. Um, they get maybe 300 to 400 mils of rain on average. They have uh, very serious problems with uh, soil erosion, uh, of course, uh, consistent problems with drought, and consistent problems with flooding because of the, uh, the soil's inability to take on the water that falls. So often, uh, because you have the two, the two rainy seasons during the year, as the organic uh, matter levels have fallen in the soils and the tendency for soil to act as a sponge has been diminished, um, you're getting these increasing, increasingly worse and worse levels of uh, erosion uh, within the country. I, I've spoken to a number of uh, uh, people from uh, ministries dealing with agriculture and irrigation in the country, and they'll tell me uh, they keep going to these areas that maybe 10 or 15 years ago that they, were, they, they would be able to travel in no problem, and whenever the rains come, they consistently have problems with people that get stuck in their cars because, again, the, the, the water levels are, are just far too deep. Uh, the soils are not able to take on the water quickly enough, and consistently they are unable to find any kind of stability um, in any way, shape, or form. So in, in talking about water as a theme uh, for the conference, and in particular what's happening in Somalia, um, it's, it's critical that many of the techniques that were covered by, by Brad, uh, by many of the things that were discussed by Tony, uh, these are things that are definitely part and parcel of what we would like to integrate into our, our particular plan. But what's, what's interesting is a lot of the best solutions are, are, have been uh, carried out in Africa for quite, for quite some time. Uh, Tony mentioned having, uh, working with uh, Dr. Chris uh, Rij, from, from, uh, from Holland. I had the, the pleasure of meeting him in Switzerland back in July, and I had a chance to, to not only meet him, but also a gentleman by the name of uh, Jakuba Sawadogo, um, who uh, there was a film made about him called The Man Who Stopped the Desert. And he has been doing some pretty remarkable work in uh, Burkina Faso. And he has basically taken uh, a, a region of the country, which is very similar to many of the pictures that you saw Tony show in his presentation, barren, sandy soil, nothing growing, 
and he has been able to basically regreen this portion of the Sahel. And actually what, what Dr. Dr. Uh, Rich called the, the most remarkable example of uh, uh, dealing with land degradation and desertification that he's seen, again, in his 25 or 30 years. Now this is a man who is uh, illiterate, he can't read, and um, he pretty much did a lot of this work on his own without having any formal training. And relating this back to this discussion about the work that NGOs are doing, it really begs the question, um, like what, what do people like Yakuba know that these organizations that have seemingly very qualified people, highly trained people, what does he know that, that they don't know? Why is he able to accomplish uh, you know, this, re this remarkable transformation of barren landscapes on his own um, that these other organizations are seemingly unable to, with the exception of, with, with the exception of some, these other organizations are seemingly unable to, um, to, to carry out. And there, there are a couple of other examples I wanted to point to, and one in particular is, um, how many of you are familiar with the Los Plateau Watershed Rehabilitation Project in China? Okay, there are quite a few. Okay, I, I, I also had the chance to meet John Liu in, in Switzerland at the same event. And with that said, I, I'd actually like to show that, a graphic about that uh, particular project. I'm sorry, I'm all over the place. Too much information. Great. So there's, a, there's an interesting breakdown of the cost of that project that uh, really, again, caused me to ask a lot of questions about just the nature of the response to a lot of these problems that are undertaken by the international NGOs. And um, this was a, a project that was funded by the World Bank, and for as much flack as the World Bank, Bank um, catches, this was actually something that they, they got very, very right. Okay, this, this was a project that um, was funded to the tune of half a billion dollars. Uh, it started in the mid-90s, and it was funded through to uh, 2005. It, it covered an area approximately the size of Belgium. It's 35,000 square kilometers, it's three and a half million hectares. And if you break down the investment uh, per unit area, it's $142.86 investment. And when you look at the return on the investment, they brought two and a half million people out of poverty within the four poorest regions of China for $142.86 a hectare. Like, why can't they do this all over the world? Because, and this is a project that actually happened. That's, this, isn't, this isn't theoretical. And, and there's a great movie, actually, if, if you have an opportunity to see it, um, that John Liu uh, made called Hope in a Changing Climate that is absolutely remarkable to see the transformation of this area that was completely barren, completely degraded, consistently uh, subject to drought and flooding, couldn't grow anything there, and was transformed in the span of a, of a decade, and people are now able to make a living. Actually, they cut the, the, rate, the poverty rate from 59% to 27%, and they've uh, either doubled or tripled the incomes of the people that live within this region. So this is a, this is a model that could very easily be replicated if, if, if the organizations or the institutions that have the funding and have the capital, if they were willing to put the capital up to actually do this type of project work. This is the kind of thing that could very easily be done in a place um, like Somalia. Now, I'm aware that a, a lot of people like to cast <laughs> Somalia as a, as a security problem, and which I find very curious because it's, it's not like jumping in a 20-foot dinghy with an outboard motor chasing an 800-foot ship 20 kilometers out to sea is kind of a, that's like a really great way to make a living. I'm sure if there, was, if there was an alternative that there would be people who would be willing to take up that, that activity. And actually a, a, a testament to that, 
And if, if, if Dr. Is Dr. Julia Wright in the room? Is she still here? Um, I had the pleasure of sitting on a panel with, with Dr. Wright in London in June uh, talking about uh, a, something that she has uh, called stabilization agriculture. And it was a great example of a gentleman named James Brett who runs an organization called uh, Plant for Peace. And what he's done is he's gone into the tribal areas of Afghanistan, which is, I mean, this is Taliban territory. And he has convinced, <laughs> he has convinced these folks in the heart of, of, of what is, you know, the, the strongholds of, of the Taliban and convinced them that growing pomegranates instead of opium is a, is a good idea. So he, he had walked through this region and he had seen pomegranates growing very well in this part of Afghanistan. And he said, look, you know, if, if I could find a market for these things that you're growing, um, would you be interested in, in, you know, kind of going into business with me? And I'm like, okay. So apparently he goes back to the UK and he ends up starting this, this business called um, Pomegranate. That's the, that's the name of the company, right, Dr. Wright? It's Pomegranate. And when it's, when, when it's all said and done, he was able to get, because he was able to find a market for this product, he was able to get a better price for pomegranates than the Afghans were getting for opium. <laughs> like, was just kind of, like, I, and I, I kind of turned, we sat on the panel together, I kind of turned to him, I was like, you serious? You can get a better price for pomegranates than you get for opium? And then, he, and then there's a picture of him in a film. There's, there's, there are quite a few films on YouTube. There's a picture of him burning a big pile of, um, of, of poppies. Or, or, was it, or actually, was it? And, and it's going up in smoke. And then now what he's saying, he's expanding the line to include other crops that grow very well in that region. So we're talking about nuts and stone fruits and all kinds of things to, to make value-added products that can be sold on the market. Now, if, if that's not a demonstration that places like Afghanistan are not security problems, Afghanistan is not a security problem. People that can't make money to buy the things that they need or supply themselves with the things they need, you get desperate. And you'll do anything you can to, to feed your families. So again, the Afghans aren't Klingons. The Somalis aren't Klingons. They're human beings. They need to make a living. If you give them an opportunity to make a decent living, they will take up that activity instead of picking up a gun and risking life and limb to make a couple of bucks. And why this is so difficult to understand by, by people that are supposedly qualified and educated is, is beyond me and it's something I've been struggling to understand for quite some time. And, and again, it's not because the models don't exist. The models do exist. I mean, this, this is an actual project. Plant, Plants for Peace is an actual project. Pomegranate is an actual product that is being sold in markets. Why can't you do that all over the world? So, in th this, you know, in talking about what permaculture can, can, can furnish, furnish us with in trying to address areas of, of, of need, um, I was kind of struggling with, with trying to figure out what I was gonna talk about um, in this presentation because I, I, it wasn't, I don't think talking about specific techniques was of, was of interest. Because the idea that is, for, is that permaculture is something that is used to again address the problems within a society because there is a problem of production as, as E.F. Schumacher uh, had famously put it. Um, how, do you, how do you properly contextualize the application of permaculture within, within specific situations? where the people that you are attempting to help can see themselves engaging in that activity. And I think in, in a lot of ways, that's where many missed opportunities in permaculture are, that, that's where we, we miss, I think, you know, some really amazing opportunities to help a lot of people. I mean, one of, the, one of the places I went to recently was, I went to Detroit last year. And that's a, that's a particular context in which the application of permaculture, if you understand that situation, if you understand what is at the core of why Detroit is falling apart, if you know how to address those people and you present it in a way that, that people in Detroit can see themselves engaging in this activity, then it would spread like wildfire. But, but, if, but if there's a failure to speak to people in a, in a way that, that they can identify with the solution, 
then the problem isn't permaculture. The problem is the presentation of it. Okay. So in, in talking about some, again, some of the specifics of, of the Somali case, um, there, there are some themes that have that consistently pop up throughout history in, in places that have uh, degraded landscapes and eventually how that impacts the society of the civilization at large. All of the, the major threats within Somalia, the environmental threats, again, are things like burning of forests and the uprooting of mature trees for charcoal to be exported for hard currency. Again, um, the, the places where a lot, of this, a lot of these products go is actually the Arabian Peninsula. Um, which, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll get to some of the problems I have with with, again, the way a lot of business happens there. Uh, two, due to poor maintenance and fuel shortages in major water rig points that are now almost idle, nomads overpopulate areas with water wells and boreholes, et cetera, leading to severe land degradation in those areas. Lack three, lack of properly graded roads leads to truckers and private cars choosing to drive on virgin land, leading to hundreds of kilometers of <laughs> land. This also contributes to the creation of dry rivers and canyons that spoil pasture land which is very important because roughly 69 to 70% of, uh, of Somalia is used for um, uh, uh, the grazing of animals. Only roughly about 1.5% of, of Somalia is actually used for cultivated um, agriculture. Very small percentage. Uh, four, wildlife is poached without any mercy with most emigrating to neighboring countries. Now this was this was one of the most disturbing things to me. I was actually given a report that was uh, published five years ago, and it says most of the animals that are poached from Somalia end up in the United Arab Emirates and Sharjah. And, and the thing I found curious was, instead of paying people pennies on the dollar, basically, for their animals, why don't you invest in the country? Why don't you invest in the country for, so they, they can raise the food that actually you need? Because there's a, there's a huge problem with future food, secu food security in, in most of the Arab world. Uh, five, lack of renewable energy sources results in heavy dependency on wood and charcoal for cooking. Six, heavy felling of trees by nomads for sheltering livestock, as 70% of Somalis are nomad, nomads uh, following the rains. Their, their constant movement increases the need for more shelters for both humans and livestock, which in turn leads to more trees being felled. Now, there's something like a 370% uh, increase in bare land over the course of the last uh, 15 to 20 years due to that. Uh, again, um, toxic waste dumping, huge problem. Um, there have been very high, uh, very uh, huge increases in uh, the incidence of cancer. Uh, in Somalia due to the dumping of toxic waste off the coast and it's been washing up on the beaches. Actually, that's one of the things that prompted the quote-unquote piracy, is a lot of people were going out to find out where the waste was coming from. Uh, and number nine, uh, physical degradation that mainly refers to soil loss and erosion, right, and includes phenomena such as the, uh, the deposition of undesirable sediments, deteriorating soil, and the like. Um, I think this quote is very appropriate. There are no economies without environments, but there are environments without economies. And unfortunately, Somalia is a country without an environment or an environment that, that is becoming increasingly more and more inaccessible. And if there is investment in helping to restore the environment, they can actually give people a means by which to be able to support themselves and, and support their families. Uh, and um, probably one of the last things I want to show here. Uh, how many people are familiar with these two books? <laughs> Okay, uh, I think given some of the information that I've passed along, I think Jared, Jared Diamond's had some of the uh, greatest insights into really characterizing the, the theme of what we see in so much of the world right now and, and relating it to a, a historical continuum as to, again, why do we see these problems consistently occur in human civilizations and societies in spite of all of our technological advancement in spite of all of our great gadgets and, and novel devices, why are we unable to solve these problems? Right? And consistently, he says, right, the most commonly cited causes of civilizational collapse, in both books said to be, again, deforestation and habitat destruction, soil problems such as erosion, salinization, and soil fertility losses, and water management problems. 
And in Carter and Dale's book, uh, they basically say that somewhere upwards of, oh, they say, how many civilizations? 30. They say basically upwards of 30 civilizations have all fallen victim to the same reasons. Why do we keep seeing this? <laughs> Why does, why, is, why does this always occur if we're so intelligent? Another great quote from Dr. Christine Jones, esteemed Australian soil scientist. The most meaningful indicator for the health of the land and the long-term wealth of a nation is whether soil is being formed or lost. If soil is being lost, so too is the economic and ecological foundation on which production and conservation are based. This has been reported by people like the United Nations Environment Program. This is, if you're not familiar with this report, this is one of the most important reports, especially if you're trying to appeal to people for funding or investment, this is one of the most important things you can get your hands on. Because what the UNEP has furnished us with are the, are the financial and the business motivated justifications for investing in earth repair and ecosystem restoration work. And within this report, they've noted that the benefit to cost ratios for investing in these efforts are anywhere between 3 to 75, and the return on investment is anywhere from 7 to 79%. I asked a, 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 Bear, a former Bear Stearns guy, Wall Street guy, if he knew that he had an investment opportunity that, that would net him these numbers whether or not he would be interested in putting the money up. He said, absolutely, absolutely. This is directly from the UN. So in talking about how permaculture can be used in places like Somalia, in places that have experienced unrest and instability due to either natural disaster or armed conflict, uh, really, uh, my contention has always been that the arguments for implementing these solutions, the strongest argument isn't necessarily the environmental one. It's actually the business one. Um, because the profitability um, that is found within a particular natural, uh, a set of natural capital assets, we'll call it, is found in the biodiversity of the system. The biodiversity is what provides you with the fertility and the stability and the productivity, right? That is able to form the basis for the creation of an economy. And I think th these are the, are the ways in which we can most strongly argue for all of the different practices that fall under the umbrella or that are inspired by, the, by, by ideas such as permaculture or in general, as it's called in, in much of the academy, um, agroecology. So everything from permaculture to regenerative agriculture, biological farming or biointensive farming, carbon farming, holistic management, key line design, all of these systems, the strongest argument is the business argument. And increasingly, you're finding more and more people from the business sphere that are realizing this. People like Jeremy, Jeremy Grantham. If anyone's familiar with Jeremy Grantham, this is, a, this is a billionaire asset manager who recently had come out last month talking about all of these issues related to peak soil and peak phosphorus and peak, all of these things. A lot of these people are seeing the handwriting on the wall. People like George Soros and Jim Rogers have been talking about the importance of investing in things like agriculture um, and, and systems of food production because they're seeing that these issues are going to be more and more serious as we go forward and undeniable. You cannot deny them. This is, this is really, I think, at the heart of this work that we're trying to do in places like Somalia. Because the place is, is about as low as, it, as, as you can go, because it's been broken down as much as you can imagine, as, one, as much as any country can be broken down, it's in places like this that you can model these solutions. You have people that are ready to take on these ideas. And, and they're just looking for something that will get them out of, the, out of this, this hole that they've been in for two decades. And I, I think the, there's, a, there's an imperative, I think there's a moral imperative, but I think there's also a business imperative, that we have to, we have to start looking at all of these ideas in these terms, because this is how we will be able to, to gain access to the resources that will allow us to engage 
the world on a, on a massive scale and, and deploy these ideas to people that really, really need them. It, there are a lot of people that really, really need what everybody in this room has to offer. So I, 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 I would really encourage you to, to again, look at, at, at your work through this lens because I think this is really the future of, of what it is that we're engaged in. So I guess I'll, I'll end it there and um, hopefully I have a chance to speak with many of you afterwards if you're at all interested in, in uh, investigating this further. But I thank you for your time and uh, apologize for any deficiencies in the talk. That's for me and I was nervous and, <laughs> and hope, hopefully uh, again, you got some benefit from it. Thank you.